welcome to the D3-D4 Football Podcast with me, your host, James Richards. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another D3-D4 Football Podcast. From my perspective, it is a really fine morning, and I'm sure it is from the perspective of both my guests as well. This is, uh, if you're new to us, a podcast covering League 1 and 2 only. They are, of course, the best divisions in world football. That is a fact. Um, if you don't believe me, you can check with the fax office. Um, they've got a very good customer service team, apparently. Um, but the two guests I am joined with today is my original podcast co-host, Luke Saunders. You're becoming a bit of a fair weather podcast, Luke. Only on here when Cheltenham doing well. Yeah, yeah. Call, call me, call me fickle. <laughs> no, no. It's yeah, always good. Just like you, both teams on a seven game and and beat and run. I think now. So uh, yeah. Really happy this morning. And our special guest, uh, it was going to be Harry Maguire, but actually someone better came up, and it is uh, Cheltenham centre-back Charlie Raglan. Welcome to the show, Charlie. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> he's not, he's not uh, a bad player, is he? No, well, he, yeah, he, he obviously learns from you very well. <laughs> clearly clearly very, uh, very good uh, defence you're part of at the moment. Are you enjoying your football? Yeah, loving it. Um, and like Luke said, obviously, uh, a good sequence of um, results at the minute, um, which makes it all the more um, pleasing. And yeah, it was it would have been a difficult one for me if we'd have ended that yesterday. So uh, thankfully, we we got a, we got a good win, and uh, makes me all the more enthusiastic to to speak to you guys today. Yeah, well, hopefully it'll be more enthusiastic than uh, a certain Mr. Boyle when he was on our podcast after a certain defeat. When it, Luke six uh, six two or something to Coventry, six oh, really? to Coventry last season, uh, two seasons ago. Yeah, that was uh, that that was that was difficult. <laughs> I did I did speak to him about his um, his appearance on here, but he didn't mention the the previous result. No, <laughs> yeah, that's quite quite interesting. I, I can yeah. sense the uh, the sort of stormy mood from his side of the microphone. Actually, <laughs> well, hopefully I, I don't sound much better. I don't think, but um, inside I'm. I'm, I'm buzzing. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. Wonderful to see. But before we get into anything, I have to ask you the question. Um, and it's what we ask all our guests is, how did you first get into football? What what got you hooked to this beautiful game? Um, I think it was more just being around uh, friends at school who who always played. I actually probably wasn't that interested, um, but I had a you know few good friends who loved it and their their families pushed them to play. And, you know, I was sort of, left to, to find my own way but I got playing and um, started watching football and um, grew up a Manchester United fan so you know in the, I'll beat that out don't worry in the uh, <laughs> in the late late 90s early 2000s that's a, a good a good time to support that club so yeah it was easy to get hooked um, in in that sense watching them um, and then just playing with my with my mates wow so uh, what, what was your first uh, what was your first card? how did you become or get into the professional side of the game um well i actually grew up abroad um so i was always pushing to come back and and try my hand at, at getting getting into getting into professional football and in a way it was me who sort of me and my mum really who who sent out letters and and asked and begged to be able to come in and train and um just be given any sort of opportunity to show something um that might be Given a given a chance, um, and it it was actually ironically via Walsall, who we played yesterday. Um, went there as a 15 year old, um, got told no, but Wolves were happy to have a look at me. Uh, went to Wolves, got told no, but Port Vale were happy to look at me, and they they thankfully said yes. Um, so I sort of 16 to 19, I was playing for Port Vale, uh, a bit of a non league stint, and then back up to Chesterfield around 20 years old uh, and then just sort of carried on from there Chesterfield, Oxford and now Chil- Cheltenham Yeah, yes it's uh, it's an interesting one sending out the letters I should try that I should, but I have to lie about my age I'll say I'm uh, up and coming so, Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they, they'll let anyone <laughs> in any of them Yeah, well I, I mean I, I don't know might get into the Oldham team right now according to what Chris <laughs> said yesterday about their performance we'll see They're probably all suspended aren't they? Yeah, they've got. Uh, yeah, they had uh, two men sent off against Mansfield and uh, conceded. wasn't a surprise, but they conceded six goals, which was just yeah. It was not a good weekend last. It wasn't a good week at all last week for Oldham. So no. felt for felt for them a bit after I saw that they lost in the last minute to Macclesfield yesterday. 
Um, it's going to be a tough season, I think, for the Latics and our podcast co-host Chris Stringer. He wasn't happy at all. <sighs> but let's uh, let's move up a division and jump into our League One roundup. League One. And guys, the first big bit of news really was the appointment of Phil Parkinson at Sunderland. Um, I think it's a I think it's an interesting appointment. Certainly, I mean, I was a big fan of Parky growing up because he played in the heart of midfield for a very successful Reading side. Uh, my uncle, a big Reading fan, so know a lot about him from his playing days. He was a real legend, real leader uh, for the Royals. And then, of course, he went into into management, got into Colchester. Um, if anyone doesn't know much about Colchester back when he took over, I mean, they were a side completely different to what they are now. Now they have this great academy, a wonderful setup. Back then they were just up from non-league, very old school uh, setup. They didn't have uh, sports science. They didn't have any of that side of the game at all. And Phil Parkinson, he brought all that in. Um, he was given good time, actually, by the Colchester chairman. Um, you know, he, he backed him when things weren't going quite so well. And he got them promoted uh, unbelievably to the championship for the first time in the club's history. Um, remarkable stuff. Put together a really good group of players, played some lovely football. Um, I don't know if you remember the the teams. People listening to this, I'm, I'm sure, will remember Alumo and uh, Umalumo and uh, Curitan up front, but they had they had Dugid, Kem Is it? Um, you know, just a, a really wonderful group of players. And he then moved on to Hull. He had a tough time there, tough time at Charlton, but Brad fans swear by him. He went to Bradford. I'm pretty sure, and Luke, you might be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but was he not the manager of Bradford when they beat Chelsea in the FA Cup? Yeah, so he 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 engineered both that with 4-2 win at Stamford Bridge and in their penalty shootout win over Arsenal took them in the Carabao Cup. So two great cup runs, and obviously he took them to the, I think it was the semi-finals of the Carabao Cup, wasn't it? And they lost to, to Swansea. Um, or did it, was it the final? Okay, it, it was the it, final, I think. Yeah. Final, yeah, and as a as a League Two club, that is that is an astonishing achievement. He then obviously, as well, he got them out of got them out of League Two. I mean, I, th- I think when he took over, they they were a lower sort of um, sort of lower mid table side, and and he and he turned them around, um, and a massive club as well. I think I think that's why it's a great appointment for Sunderland because he's shown um, they are two two clubs. Obviously, I'd say Sunderland are obviously the bigger bigger team um, in recent years, but. He's shown he can turn things around at a club um, of that size, and, and with his experience, I think it's a really good appointment for them. Not a great result yesterday, but yeah, certainly, uh, certainly someone who perhaps has the potential to turn things around for him. What do you what do you make of it, Charlie? Because uh, we'll come to it in a minute. But fan reaction was was pretty pretty negative towards his appointment. Yeah, I, well, on the fan reaction, I just think at the minute Sunderland fans are. In that mindset of any decision made, they're going to sort of show a bit of backlash. I just think they're an angry bunch at the minute. Um, you know, they are a massive club and everyone knows that. Uh, and, you know, I don't think they really look into whoever the manager manager is. They, 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 they probably weren't going to be happy with it. Um, but on Parkinson, my my experiences of that, of that Bradford side uh, around the time when they beat Chelsea, um, that was sort of my... Uh, meetings with them and later on when he went to Bolton um, and yeah they were always I mean tough to beat uh, organised at the time they were always seemed to be physical both Bradford and Bolton you know really big side um, the likes of James Hansen up top um, uh, trying to think of the rest of the team actually Philippe Murray uh, Gary Liddell um, so some experienced pros in there and obviously later Bolton Beavers Wheater Gary Medine up top uh, and he's had success. Uh, I also think he's he's a good age for a manager um, who's, like you say, had ups and downs, plenty of ups, especially in League One. So, um, and yeah, I'd, I'd I'd say give him time. He, he can build good, solid sides who who know how to to win football matches at, at that level. And as a man, I think he's an extremely impressive character. Dealt with dignity mm. with the situation that they had at Bolton. Um, mm. Must have been must have been extremely difficult. I mean. The challenges that he had at Bolton, I don't think people truly appreciate, and I'm sure he will um, at some point come out with exactly what it was that he was dealing with behind the scenes. But frankly, I think to, I'll be honest now, Sunderland fans, I saw some tweets that I just felt were outrageously unfair. Um, and this, maybe I'm a bit biased, maybe I like Parky because historically I've watched him play and I know him from, from my child as, as a player, but 
I, I just think, you know, you've got a new manager. Uh, you've got to back him. You've got to trust the decision. If you look at his record at League One and in the short term, there is no other goal for Sunderland than to get out of League One. You can't start planning anything beyond that. And I know the investment group are coming in to help plan beyond that because at some point Sunderland will get out of League One. There's no doubt about it. But you've got to, in the short term, make sure you do do that. You've got a man who's got a proven track record of doing it. Whether or not you like the style of football he plays, well, you can't really judge him too harshly on the situation he inherited at Bolton. He was always going to have um, the, a difficulty getting them to play with swagger and style because he just didn't have resources compared to those around him in the championship, especially to to, to get that kind of squad together. So he had to, to win it. Um, but you still got that team promoted. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he did. Yeah, I, I, um, I just think the comments were out, outrageous. And I think, they were unfair. And yeah, sorry, mate. And I said, sorry, no, I was just saying, I think the team that he's got now is inherited at Sunderland is a is a much better. They've got much better players. Um, and I listened to his interview after the game yesterday, and he spoke about adapting his style of play. And I think you have to. And you know, the likes of Medidi and Maguire, Watmore, Ledbetter, Power, uh, Grid, they they. They've been brought up and and always played good football in the teams they've been a part of. So uh, I wouldn't worry too much on that sense. You know, if I was a Sunderland fan, um, he he will he just looks like you said being a, being a good bloke um, doesn't get too high, doesn't get too low. So he he should bring stability really to those players and a bit of freedom. I'd, I'd hope. Yeah, let's hope so. And and to be fair to the Sunderland fans who listen to this podcast regularly. Um, you know, there was quite a few voices there saying, you know, give him time, back him, and good luck to him. So, hopefully, those Sunderland fans who um, will will come around to him, and I think he'll be a very popular figure there. Actually, I don't think you can judge him on a defeat away at Wickham. Wickham have the best record at home in the division. They've got 20 points from their home games so far, uh, at least four more, I think, than any other t- team in League One. So, you know, that's a very very tough ask. And Charlie White, of course did his ankle ligaments in the game. So that's a, a disappointment because he's, go, he's going to be a, a good player, I think. And Parkinson is the kind of manager that will get the best out of players like Why And I fully expect him to get a lot more out of Will Grigg than uh, Jack Ross was able to as well. So, um, But huge credit to Wickham. Let's, let's give them their the dues. I mean, they are absolutely flying. Gareth Ainsworth being linked with jobs everywhere for good reason. Uh, second in the table. I mean, you know, Luke, this is a Wickham team that you just, you know, budget-wise, um, historically, they always struggled when they've got to League One. It's it's a huge achievement, this. Yeah, it is absolutely, and and it's it's got better and better for them because I think when I was last on, um, they they were again they were up there, they'd won all their home games and they'd drawn their away games, which you know if you keep that up for the season, it's promotion form. But and at that time there was that massive link with Ainsworth going back to another one of his former clubs in Lincoln, but they've managed to keep hold of him. I mean, it's all it's all gone so well for them. Despite their budget and their small squad, they continue to thrive. He's he's got a, a system that works really well for him there, four three three, um, and you know it's amazing how Akin Fenver is still as effective as he is in this system. But it's not all about him. They've got some some real pace alongside him on on the wings, um, and they also have a good habit of staying in games and and across the course of this season. Obviously, yesterday's goal was quite early in the game, but they do they do get some very late goals, especially at Adams Park, but. I find what I find quite interesting. They're a team that surrender a lot of possession. I think in their last eight matches, they they've had less possession than the opposition, and in two of those, they've had 37% and 28%, and those have been their their biggest results, including a 3-0 win at Rochdale. So they only had 28% of the ball in their 3-0 win at Rochdale. So that shows a great sign of organisation, um, and and he's working working wonders there, um, is Ainsworth. Yeah, fantastic to see. I, I'm really shocked that uh, they've maintained this kind of form. I mean. Um, massive credit to Gareth Ainsworth, massive credit to the club for always sticking by him as well. They've always backed him and he's, uh, he's mm. thriving. Another, another sign that if you back your manager, give him time, they always do well. I think that's a message that we consistently put out. I mean, not always the case, but I think it is vast majority of the time. Uh, Bolton still without a win. They lost 3-1 to Rochdale, but they did take the lead in this one, but it's, it's going to be a tough ask for Bolton Wanderers, um, uh, based on the, the fact they've sort of piggled a squad together. Um, very late in the window to try and get themselves out of trouble. I think they're 20 points with the minus eight at the moment, clear of of danger. So it does look very much like they are certainties to go down. Doncaster, fantastic performance against Bristol Rovers yesterday, a 2-0 win. 
um, at home against the Bristol Rovers side that have done very, very well this season. I've been hugely impressed with Graham Coughlin's side. I think they've put together a nice squad. Um, not got much depth, perhaps, but you know, on the budget that he has available, I think he's put together a really good group of competitive players. And in Fleetwood, you've got a side that are absolutely flying. And Paddy Madden, I was shocked about this. This is his first ever hat-trick in the Football League. Um, Charlie Fleetwood, historically a very small team. Joe Barton, there's a lot of questions about whether or not he would be a, a good coach, but he's certainly done well since joining that club um, sort of a, in last summer, hasn't he? Yeah, uh, and I think it's similar to what you said about Gareth Ainsworth. And I mean, he's, he hasn't been there as long, but it is his second season now. Uh, and like I said, Paddy Madden has proven goal scorer at that level. Um, from my own experience, he's playing against him when he's at Stunthorpe. He's, he's everything you want in a striker, really. He's... Um, well, he's, he's, he chased everything down. He's a good age now, I think about 29. Uh, chase everything down, hold it up, always running in behind, always on the shoulder, which is a nightmare for, for defenders. And that's what, you know, I hear, you know, the best coaches I've had have always told strikers to do that. And, you know, he's getting his just rewards, um, with his goals at the minute. Uh, and he's also playing alongside another really good striker I played with who can occupy a couple of centre backs on his own. And that's Chad Evans. So. You know, he's, he's added a couple in. Um, so the two of them, uh, and some of the signings that Fleetwood made, yeah, they've, they've, uh, they're going well, especially at home. Yeah, not, not easy to beat Burton. Uh, they're a side that technically some very good players. I think they've got a good manager in, in Mr. Clough. So a fantastic victory. Well done to Paddy Madden. A great, uh, great result for him. Great to see him get his hat trick and just surprised it's taken him that long with his goal scoring record that he hadn't scored one before now, but. Uh, Peter, no surprise to see them motor on. They beat Gillingham 2-1. Um, there was a goal in this game that didn't come from Ivan Tony, Marcus Madison, or uh, or Moisa, which is uh, which is rare. But uh, no, Ward did smack one in. Joe Ward uh, with a fantastic strike. They're good at fantastic strikes at Peterborough. They t- they seem to score pretty much worldies every every game. So um, no surprises there, Luke. Actually, I mean. When Dan Ferguson came back, there's a lot of negativity because, of course, you know he'd been sacked before. Going back to get a manager who's been at the club doesn't always work. Um, it didn't. Well, it kind of didn't work for his second spell in charge. But he's putting together, along with a, a great squad of players, a, a lovely run of football, playing nice style of football as well. Um, and if you look at all the stats and the metrics, such as you know getting into the opposition box, the number of shots that they have, the number of chances they create. They're, they're right up the top of, of pretty much all those metrics that suggest that they're a side going to be very, very high up at the end of the season. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, as you say, he's done really well coming back. And, you know, Posh have always been one of those teams, especially in League One, that they've always had two or three players that consistently get double figures. Um, I mean, do you remember the start they had last year? Um and, and, and the players they had there. But they, but again, they, they tend to lose these strikes. I mean, over the years, I always remember um, players like Asamba Longa and Obviously, last year, I think they had um, Godden and the guy that's now at Shrewsbury. His name um, escapes my name. He was at Luton. Cummings. Oh, that's the one, yeah. So, so he, and, and now they've got Ivan Tony, who's obviously a really, you know, proven player at this level. Mo Issa, someone I know from his time at Cheltenham. Um, and Marcus Madison, someone that, that's still playing in League One is beyond me um, with the quality he has. Um, but obviously, Tony and Issa now have 10 goals each, I think, this season so far. So that they're in that vein. The, the key for Posh is, is can they keep this up for... For the rest of the season, because consistently over the last few years that they've made this this brilliant start and they've been up there up towards the top six and seven and, and they have fallen off. So the key is just keeping it going for the whole season because they're, they're always a team that will be in and around it in League One and that, that I rarely, rarely expect them and to see them struggle. Um, so that it's just a case of keeping that consistency now for them. Yeah, to put that into context, so they've scored 20 goals between them. Only five sides in League One combined have actually scored more than those two. Um, ridiculous. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, they're they're doing fantastic. Well, 30 goals Posh have scored the most of uh, any side in the top four tiers of English football. If Man City fans are going to complain that Posh have played more games, I don't want to hear it. We know that Peterborough are better than Man City. So, uh, there we go. Um, the other result that struck me yesterday was obviously Wimbledon beating Portsmouth by goal to nil. Uh, just, you know, Portsmouth. Nothing goes right at the moment. I mean, if you saw on the highlights, they... They should. I don't know how they didn't get a goal in this game. And, and again, like I look at data all the time, and their their shot data and their xG data, it's all very positive. But the results simply are not are not happening. 
And to lose to AFC Wimbledon, who have struggled this season, by the way, that's their third straight win on the bounce. Glyn Hodges take a bow. That's a brilliant uh, run of form, considering the struggles they had at the start. But Kenny Jacket, massive pressure. A lot of fans don't want him to remain. I'm really not sure. Uh, well, Charlie, let's get your opinion on this, because Kenny, Kenny Jacket, again, a proven manager at this level, this has not been a good start, three wins in 11, but is it is no. it time to sack him, do you think, or...? Or, you know, uh, well, I, I wouldn't want to. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be the one that says, yeah, he should he should be sacked. Um, but I just I look at it from the fans' point of view, uh, and in the last couple of years, and getting promoted from League Two, where they had uh, Paul Cook and someone who I can comment on in terms of the style of play, I feel that that's that's probably been the, the biggest, obviously lack of results, but the biggest issue I think is around style of play. Um, and you know the sort of chalk and cheese really from Paul Cook, Kenny Jacket's a bit more direct. You know he spent one million pound on John Marcus, I think, uh, who's very much a big target man. Um, are they playing a bit too sort of uh, direct for for the fans liking? And then combining that with lack of results, yeah, there's, there's going to be unrest. Um, but I, like I say, he's proven and the Pompey massive side, massive club. Sorry. Uh, some some good players, Marcus Harness, who did great last year at Burton, um, played with him for a bit as well, and uh, I'd, I would I would stick with it for for for, for the next few games at least. Um, but how how long do you give it uh, if they if they really got ambitions of of being up there competing with the likes of Peterborough and uh, Wickham and Ipswich, and they, they need to get results quick. They do. They do. It's going to be interesting to see how long the American owners give him. That moment, they've they've got endless patience, it seems. But fantastic result for Wimbledon, nonetheless. Coventry City, they took 6,274 fans to watch a nil-nil draw at MK Dons. Um, doesn't seem fair, football sometimes. But, you know, fair play to MK Dons. That's an important result for them because they've been on a terrible run. I think it was four or five straight defeats before this. So stopping that rot for Paul Tisdale, very important. Got a bit lucky, penalty miss in this one. But I have to say, regardless of the football, when we talk about Coventry and Mark Robbins, who signed a new contract, of course, um, last week. We talk about them in terms of their football. But in terms of their supporters, I just have to take my hats off to them because they have been treated with disrespect, uh, disregard, and you know, totally trodden on. Um, whether you blame the owners, the council, whoever, I'm not going to get into it. But at the end of the day, they've had a tough, tough time, and yet they back their team unbelievably well yeah, I know this is a massive crowd 6,000 but you know you just look at their away crowds in general um, the fact that they're having to travel to home games now outside of the city is a complete travesty um, and I just take my hats off to you guys because it's fantastic to see you following your team all over the place I mean as an Oxford fan we've been through some tough times non-league was never uh, never something that I could even imagine when I was watching them in the championship as a, as a kid but you know, to see Coventry, to see my watch in the Premier League under under Gordon Strachan, you know, regularly with some great players, great results. Uh, to see them go down to the fourth division and have to play at Sixfields and now at St Andrews, it's it's not right. Football needs to, I think, have a big look at itself uh, in the way it's organised and the way it's run. But Coventry fans are a credit to their club. So really well done, guys. Fair play to you. Uh, I move on to Oxford because going to Rotherham, Without Ben Woodburn, without Rob Dickey, I was a bit worried about this. And Charlie, this is a club, obviously, that you've played for, and it'd be good to get your insight, because unbelievable run of form. Seven games without defeat for Oxford. Moving into the playoff places with that victory. The last two games, in particular, against Doncaster and Rotherham, have impressed me, because I, you know, it's all very well you, you beat a uh, Gillingham side that had a really bad game at the Kassam, but... Beating teams like Doncaster, who are very technically good. I mean, they you know they made light work of Bristol Rovers yesterday, and and Rotherham <coughs> under Paul Warren. It's it's been brilliant. Yeah, yeah, they have. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And I think I think that's five clean sheets as well in in those in those games. Yeah. Um. So yeah, they've they've, they've done they've done amazingly well, uh, and I think they've just sort of clicked really. Um. I've mentioned the five clean sheets because that was a problem last year. I think. You know, conceding too many goals and then obviously lack of goals, it is a an obvious downfall if you want it to be at the top end of the table. Um, and now I think Jamie Mackey's got a few. Matty Taylor's come in, who I, I didn't play with, but has by all accounts um, done well when he's been fit. 
Uh, and they have got maybe not strength in in depth as such, but strength in quality. I mean, if you look at the likes of obviously Ben Woodburn's injured, um, Rob Hall, you know, he's a top top player and he, he he can't get on the pitch at the minute. So you know, I'd 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 be I'd be confident. I'd be really really pleased if I was an Oxford fan. Um, and you, you talk about the likes of Sunderland's and um, Portsmouth in in League in League One. Oxford's a big big club. Um, you know, I know I've heard the fans or the, the gates are, are down a little bit, but you know, especially the the, the fans that they took to Rotherham would have been fantastic yesterday. And um, yeah, I've got nothing but high praise for the for the fans and the club. Yeah, an unbelievable run, unbelievable football as well. The fact that you know, what, what do you make of the prospect of Shannon Baptiste? Because he just looks like a, a well-grounded young man who, I mean, he's such a fantastic player, gifted player for his age. Yeah, well, he, well, yeah, he is. Yeah. First of all, yeah, he's a really uh, nice lad, um, good, honest, honest lad, been brought up well, uh, and you can tell that. But I mean, it's funny because when I first went to the club around 2016, I think um, he was. So just come out of the youth team, had a lot of injuries, uh, and he he wasn't really spoken about. He was one of them who would train with us now and again, and, but you, you couldn't really see him kicking on like he has. And then I think it was pre-season, uh, not the one just gone, the one before where we we went on a tour of Ireland and he got his chance, and I think he was playing left wing, and he just took off uh, his dribbling skills, his his end product, his passing, his movement. He just glides past players. Um, and I've seen him, you know, smack a few in the top corner as well in, I think, Newport away in the, in the League Cup and obviously what I saw from the highlights of what he did to West Ham the other week. Uh, so I'm really pleased and he's, he's come back from, he's another big sign of, of the, of the man he's, he, man he is and the man he's going to become is the fact that he's come, he's come back from two really serious injuries in quick succession, um, which must have been so hard to take. Um, so he's been looked after well, but Oxford have got a really good player. Yeah, I'm delighted that he's our player. Um, it's, it's rare that Oxford get uh, players of such great quality come through. I mean, obviously, as a selling club, there's always going to be that prospect. I know scouts have been uh, filling up their allocations at the Kassam, what trying to watch him and trying to watch various other players, Cameron Brannigan developing into a really good player, uh, someone who I think struggled a little bit when he first joined at the, with the pace of the of the game at this level and the, and the physicality, but he's, he's come on amazingly well. Rob Dickey did play yesterday, who... You'll know well, um, again, technically gifted centre-back, uh, I think grown in confidence and stature this season and playing brilliantly. Um, John Massino, is a, is a, I would imagine, is a great guy and a, and a good leader. Would you would you think that? Yeah, he's a, a character, if you, if you like, but he's he's got tremendous experience. I think he's played over 500 league games or 500 games, uh, definitely. Um, I think he hit that milestone recently. But, yeah, he's like I said, experience, uh, great, great talker, um, can play various positions, um, tremendous athlete for his, for his, for his age, uh, not, not the quickest, but can run all day. Um, and yeah, he's just, just a good bloke who, who you want in your team. Um, so he's, can, I can certainly see why he's, why he's captain and, um, I'm pleased that he's, cause he had a few doubters as well. Uh, there was, you know, whispers among the fans that he wasn't quite up to it, but he's, He's, he's done great and um, like I said I'm pleased for, for all the lads you've mentioned there um, especially like Cam and, and Rob uh, and, and Oxford in general they, they deserve um, the success especially the fans and uh, hopefully they can they can carry this run on and uh, be up the top end for for the foreseeable future Yeah all the Oxford fans love Rob Hall they, the injuries he's been through really unfortunate um, we'll love to see him back on the pitch and because it's a long season there will be loads of opportunities no doubt for players that aren't currently getting uh, as many minutes as they'd like, I'm sure they'll get them and take their chance at some point in the season. But, you know, Rob Hall, legend, scored against Swindon um, yeah. in that great victory at yeah. the county ground. So, you know, he's going to, he's always going to be a popular, popular guy at, uh, at Oxford United. And brilliant stuff from, from the Yellows. They, uh, they thoroughly deserve the win. Ian Bradley has written a really good match report on our website about that. Uh, I recommend you go have a read, check it out because he gives a, a brilliant and very unbiased view of uh, of both teams, even though he's a Rotherham fan. And uh, he was extremely impressed with Oxford United yesterday in that victory. Uh, the Friday night results: Southend got a one-all draw at Tranmere. They probably should have won that, to be fair. But good to see Tom Hopper come back and, and score a goal. And uh, I watched the Shrewsbury Lincoln game. It was 
nil nil, and it doesn't surprise me that it finished nil nil. Uh, there's some good technical players on both sides. I, it just was a bit of a, a stodgy game. I think Shrewsbury in the first half, or the, certainly the first half of the first half, were very negative in the way that they set up. And given the players they've got, they can certainly do more damage than they they let on. And they started to grow into the game a bit and, and look like a side that if they commit a few more players forward, they, they'll they be very good. So I, I hope they do take that forward and, and do that. But right, uh, we'll have a quick look at the league table. I still sort of pinch myself at this stage of the season when I look at it because Oxford fly up there now but um, Ipswich are top Wickham second that's a fantastic achievement for them Peterborough, Fleetwood Oxford and Coventry make up the playoff places at the bottom Bolton on minus eight points still uh, with Southend and Accrington falling into those bottom three places with Wimbledon's win yesterday three on the bounce for them MK Dons only a point ahead of uh, their rivals uh, as they look to try and find their first win, I think in six games it will be when they next play. So uh, Tuesday night action coming up as well. So that's going to be that's going to be good for those teams that are struggling just to get straight back out there and try and pick up some much needed points. Uh, but let's jump down and let's have a look in League Two. League Two. And uh, Charlie, you were backed yesterday by the biggest away crowd in the fourth division. Uh, Cheltenham taking over yeah. 700 away fans there. That was a it looked like it was a pretty, you know, tough victory, but nonetheless, your away form from last season, which was which was pretty dreadful, you've really turned it around. That's uh, what's your fourth away victory this season? Uh, yeah, yeah I, I think so. Luke will, Luke will know more than me, actually. Well, he should <laughs> yeah, know yeah. more than me, but you'll definitely confirm it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> fourth away victory. Yeah, no, it was very good, uh, and the fans. I didn't realise that it was going to be. Well, I, wouldn't, I knew it was a it was a good following, uh, and that they were they were great the whole game. Uh, so yeah, to 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 be the uh, the highest sort of away attendance in the league is a uh, is uh, massive and uh, massively appreciated by the lads. And you know, getting back in the dressing room, you know, the fans get mentioned, and uh, uh, it was just it was just a great 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 result. Um, tough tough victory, physically tough. They. They've struggled at home and we knew that. Um, so they had really good spells where we had to really dig in and, and defend, uh, as a team, which we're not happy to do, but we're, we're comfortable doing that. Um, and then, you know, we hope that we can, uh, regain the ball and, uh, use, you know, we got some good players, uh, in the, in the final third and, uh, that proved the way the game went yesterday. Fantastic to see, uh, Luke Varney. So it's, it's weird. He, he sort of dipped out of football for a bit, or he, he appeared to, but he's he's really come on strong since joining Cheltenham, hasn't he? And a great goal yesterday. Wonderful take. Yeah. Well, I don't think he did at a club. I think that's the uh, the crazy thing about it. It took him till probably this time last year um, to sign for Cheltenham when he didn't. He was just training at home. Um, but yeah, he's he's a great, great, great lad. Um, and everybody talks about his age, but you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know it from the way he is around the place. I mean, Luke will vouch for that. He's yeah. he's just a bubbly character, so positive, um, absolutely no ego, helps helps everybody and anybody he can, um, and you know he looks after himself and he's he's a vital vital uh, part of our team, um, and it's proven that you know if he is out he comes straight back in, um, and he's I just spoke about Paddy Madden, he's he's in a similar mould to him, although you know. Uh, Luke Vans has played, uh, you know, in, in a, at the top level, so he's, he's got that pedigree behind him as well, and, and massive respect from from everyone. You, you mentioned no egos. I mean, you seem as a squad uh, to be completely united. You've got um, a good group of players, a very settled starting eleven. How how much has that character and that that group mentality helped you? Because Michael Duff seems to have really galvanised that. Yeah, well, yeah. As I was going to say, it, it, it does come from the manager. Um, and you know he, he'll. I think his recruitment um, has been spot on. Well, I would say that because he's out of me. But um, in terms of his uh, what he, what he's looked for and and the types of people that he's brought into the dressing room has been has been um, the most pleasing thing because you know we really have got a, a great bunch and we we highlight that a lot when we speak amongst ourselves um, the spirits of the team and uh, it's proven on days like yesterday when we we had our backs against the wall at times and. We had to dig deep because we had the uh, disappointment of their equaliser, uh, and they they were up and at the second half. Um, but we stood firm and managed to, to go again and and 
and get another goal and see the game out. So uh, our mentality and uh, things like that that definitely comes from the manager and it's something that we work on uh, quite frequently. That's I stand correct. That was your, I think, your third yeah, away victory of the season. Fourth from oh, beaten. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing though. I mean, it's just the turnaround from last season. You've had great home form for quite some time now, but, you know, coming into this season, I mean, you hadn't scored the first three away games of the season, didn't get a goal, and then suddenly you beat Salford, you go and beat, I mean, beating Plymouth was absolutely massive as well. Um, a point against Oldham, and then mm. a victory against Walsall. I mean, it's, you know, it's very impressive. You, if you're winning your home games, um, I mean, I think you're on a run now as it is eight unbeaten Luke is it seven or eight unbeaten in the I league it, I think it's seven I think yeah, yeah in, seven unbeaten in the league is, I think we still haven't lost at home since uh, since January so um, yeah. so yeah which I know this season Bradford and Newport had the best best home record in the league this season but if you stretch it back it's obviously it's obviously Cheltenham by quite a long way I think if you if you go back to the last time we lost the game certainly yeah it'd be yeah. interesting you know you've, you've played some decent sides as well I mean you know crew uh Came to, to came to Cheltenham and, and obviously they're flying high and uh, yeah you, you got a good good result against them one all what have you made of Crew because yesterday they were one all going into the 90th minute against Swindon uh, they beat them three one great mm. play um, they've got you know a fantastic I mean they've got the best away record in in the division and if you look at how Crew are now top of the league uh, they've actually played all of the top seven bar Forest Green which is quite a quite an important fact because it shows mm. that they're able to produce results against the big teams what what were they yeah. like as a team are they worthy of where they are do you think uh yeah definitely uh, i think they both are crew and swindon um you know it was unfortunate for well not unfortunate but swindon yeah losing so late on they'll be uh, bitterly disappointed and i think they've lost a couple of players to injury uh, recently but the, both of those teams probably caused us the most problems at home um and I think we well we went behind to both of them. We went, to, we went behind to Swindon twice. Went behind to True. Um, so, or well, did we actually? No, I don't think we did. No, we, no yeah, I think we Cruz, Yeah, I think you scored. No, we scored very early, didn't we? So, um, but yeah, no, Crew, Crew, very young team. Typical, I say typical Crew team. Uh, they they pass it well. Got really good sort of rotations in the in the middle of the pitch. Um, uh, Chris Porter um, up front, obviously. Proven goal score probably at this level, um, and yeah, the, the the work rate as well. We we sort of highlighted that as um, you know, tell them saying we highlight, highlighted that after the game uh, on their part, and were really impressed with the the work rate, the recovery runs, um, and that was something that we, you know, there's no there's, that's that's uh, there's no doubt that they'll be up there if they carry on doing doing that sort of things. Um, so yeah, the two good sides uh, and true. Um, flying high. Who would you say is the best side you you faced this season so far? Um, I'd probably say True. Um, Swindon on the day were very, very tough. Um, it was a nightmare of a day, very hot. But uh, yeah, True were very good. Plymouth away was a tough place to go, and we. We had to dig deep there as well. So yeah, the crew, Swindon, Plymouth. I don't know if it's a difficult one to say who's the best, but uh, I'd probably say crew. Yeah, I, mean, I, I did an analytic. I can't bring it up off the top of my head, but actually, um, when you look at the chances created per ninety minutes, and you look at the the, the sort of the top three or four, it's no surprise that those teams that create chances, such as Crew, Exeter, you know, they're right up there. So mm. uh, an interesting metric to to always analyse and look at because. If a team is creating one team though that actually are terrible in the numbers are Forest Green. They really, you know, they are yeah. terrible in all the numbers, but they're right up there. A two all draw with Mansfield yesterday. Uh, Dempster starting to get tuned from his side. He's got some players back. Andy Cook, who's had a, a bad run of injuries, uh, he'll be needed now because Danny Rose is out for six weeks with an ankle injury. So that was a, a massive comeback result for them. Very late in the day, um, Johnny Dempster, ex Oxford player, of course. I watched him. Play in our conference days. He did do very. I have to say, he did do very well for Oxford. He wasn't very good for us. <laughs> uh, we had a, a poor team that season, but he always he always seemed to get the brunt of it um, whenever we lost, even though he, he didn't even play half the time. So quite funny, bit of a figure of uh, figure of um, sort of jovial fun, I'd say, at Oxford. Uh, Newport, their home record, 
Uh, fantastic again, a 2-1 win. Had to dig deep against Gunthorpe, who are an improving side, but a 2-1 win nonetheless. Padraig Amund has now scored 33 goals since he joined the club. I think that's in the league and you know more than double any other player during that time, so very impressive. Um, Northampton beat Salford. Salford had a, an up-and-down start to life in the EFL, and it was always going to be that way. I think the bookies who made them overriding favourites at the start of the season, shame on you, just because they've... Uh, <laughs> They've put links to obviously big name owners. It doesn't mean anything at this level. Uh, they were they were comfortably beaten in the end by Northampton, who've had an up and down time of late. They were very poor against Scunthorpe last week. Chris Stringer was at the Macclesfield game. He he took his time out to ring me at half time to tell me it was the worst game of football he had ever seen in his life before. <laughs> and he said he'd been down the long trip to Plymouth to see them lose four one. He'd seen them lose three nil. I think he said it was at Yeovil, and yet that was still worse. Um, the only game I think I've seen that was worse than what he was describing was a game where Oxford played I think it was when we were in the conference we played an FA Trophy game against it might have been Lewis Oxford fans will know uh, and they had a 16 year old keeper in net making his debut because they hadn't got any other goalkeepers at the club at the time and we won 1-0 because of a penalty which I think I think Marvin Robinson scored it was and I I took my uh, I took my wife to that um, she's never forgiven me so uh, <laughs> Yeah, really, really dreadful stuff. So, yeah, Port Vale and Stevenage, one all. Uh, Stevenage, that's a good point for them, going to Port Vale, who are unbeaten at home this season. Plymouth piled more misery on Carlisle, a 2-0 win. I wasn't surprised at all about this. Uh, Carlisle did play very well, actually, in spells against Blackpool in the EFL Trophy in midweek. They did get injuries to McCurdy and Bridge. Um, you know, they haven't got a very deep squad there, and I think that's a massive problem for them, and a 2-0 defeat. At Plymouth, the Plymouth side that in the numbers look excellent. Uh, what you've just described, Charlie, they sound like an excellent team. And I think, like I said last week, if there's one team I think will improve from their league position, it will be Plymouth. I think they'll be right up there at the end of the season. Uh, Leighton Orient finally announced who their new manager is. It's Carl Fletcher. Uh, slightly surprising appointment. Um, Welsh international footballer, obviously played. Um, I'm trying to think of the clubs. I know he played for Plymouth. He played for he managed Plymouth as well, but he played for West Ham, Crystal Palace. Um, ended his career at Barnet, but he's most recently I think been at Bournemouth, learning uh, in the youth team there. And uh, off off probably Eddie Howe. A four 0 win. He was watching from the stands to to kickstart their uh, his tenure. Um, I'll ask you on this one, Luke. I mean, yeah. what, what do you think of that appointment? Because it's I think it's kind of refreshing to see. Late Norton go slightly left field here and give give a, a young guy a chance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, we, it's like we were discussing before the podcast, and you've seen it happen a lot in um, in recent years, and, and certainly with us at Cheltenham with with Michael um, is giving those managers um, a chance. You know, rather than going going through the old sort of merry-go-round of, of the sort of old experienced managers, sometimes that does work out quite well. But it's good to see clubs giving these these guys a chance. And I think the thing with Fletcher, and he'd be the first to admit it, reading a few sort of interviews with him, is that he wasn't ready for management. Um, he was too young um, to, to sort of be involved in that side of the game when he was at Plymouth. Um, but going to Bournemouth, you know, as you say, you, you, you can't find a better young manager, I, I think, to work under at that time than, than Eddie Howe and the way he was taking Bournemouth forward. There and I think he's overseeing their loan players. I, I can't remember the exact title of his role, but he's been obviously overseeing the how loan the manager. I think loan manager, it? yeah. So the players that have been going out, and so I, I think the key thing that Eddie Howe was sort of talking into an interview when when asked about sort of um, would he be a good fit for Leighton Orient is that he's he's built a huge amount of contacts um, at, 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 during his time at, with the Cherries. So. You know, it's one of those clubs, and it's one of those appointments. You're coming into a club that, you know, had a, a you know real tragedy over the summer with with the um, the tragic death of, of Justin Edinburgh. But Embleton's done fantastically to steady the ship there. Um, it has been a tough start, I think, other than actually winning on opening day against um, against us. That they, they really struggled at, at after that point, up until back to back wins lately. Um, so he's done brilliantly, and it's, it's not easy to go and thump Grimsby, who have been brilliant in recent weeks. Um, especially the win at Exeter, so you know he, he'll he'll leave the sort of role with his head held high in Embleton, and, and he'll always be sort of remembered for for how he kind of took on. But yeah, I think it's it's, it's a good appointment for Leighton Orient, and and hopefully he can come back into management now and, and and show that he has 
sort of taking a step forward and, and could do well for them, just like some of these young managers are doing now, in certainly in League 2. Do you think that's a good point with Charlie? It seems uh, an interesting one, certainly. Yeah, I think I think Luke said it all. Um, sort of thrown in at deep end in the past, so gone away and, and learned from, like you said, a top young manager at the highest level. Um, so, and the fact that he was, I didn't know that he was overseeing the loan players who would have probably been on loan in the likes of League One, League Two, uh, more than likely. So he's he's seen a lot of, of football at this level. Um, so he, he should have a good knowledge of the teams and the players that we're up against, which is always a big factor when you've come from, you know, the Premier League, you 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 might not know the the divisions quite as well. So um, no, I'm I'm sure. I mean, we played them when they didn't have a manager, and they they were they were a decent side then. And I like say beat at Grimsby is no um, nothing to be, uh, you know, that's a that's a big thing. So um, he'll 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 have been impressed yesterday. So um, yeah, um, hopefully he does well. Well, not too well, but <laughs> does okay. Yeah, we'll see how he gets on and good luck to him because uh, that club have, I think, dealt with everything that they went through over the summer with with massive dignity. They've been brilliant. Uh, Grimsby fans, I saw a few tweets that they didn't feel Michael Jolly played his best team, maybe rotating a little bit and it it didn't quite work. Um, Soundly beaten in the end anyway. The longest serving manager in the EFL, Jim Bentley, under a lot of pressure. But if you're under a lot of pressure and you're a Morecambe manager, you always want to go to Colchester because they do well there. And they got another victory um, and they kept a clean sheet, which is a huge result for them because they've been conceding goals um, just you know, so badly. I mean, they're the leakiest defence, I think, um, in the top four tiers of English football over the last uh, sort of in this calendar year. So they've been poor, um, no doubt about it. I mean, obviously massive challenges for him, but a very, very welcome result and uh, huge credit for them to be able to keep out Colchester, who have, apart from the defeat at Crawley, uh, they've, they've been on a decent run of late so that's uh, that's a great result for them result of the day um, for me I was, I was surprised at this one Cambridge 4 Exeter 0 now Cambridge I don't think have been as as bad as some of the results at home especially that they've, they've gotten the end of but you know Exeter have been have been really tough really tough side to beat really tough side to play against uh, Charlie Cambridge that, that's an excellent result for them yeah uh, no doubt about it and Obviously, with the home record that they've had this season, um, massively important for for confidence, and um, you know it will give the the fans a lift um, as well as the players. The players will be, and they've not beaten anybody at home. They've beaten a team that are, are flying high and haven't lost many games this season. So uh, we haven't actually played either of these teams yet. But um, again, Calderwood having another season, um, sticking by him after a tough year last year, and it, it tends to prove that. That that is the way to go, um, and I know a couple of the players. Obviously, Sam Smith doing well, which is pleasing to see after a difficult time at Oxford last year. Um, Luke Hannon, I know from Port Vale, and he got a goal yesterday. Uh, Jack Rolls on loan from Tottenham played against him a couple of times, so they've got some good, good young, hungry players as well as experienced lads like um, Mark Richards, who I don't think he was on the bench yesterday, but you know they've got they've got options there, so. Um, Massively improved from last year, where I thought they struggled. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll wait to see on Exeter. I'm sure they'll bounce back as well. Yeah, Exeter will. Yeah. Matt Taylor, I'm a really big fan of his. I think he's done an excellent job. He's a down-to-earth manager, talks a good game, and uh, certainly I think has uh, has proven so far what a good manager he is. But uh, a bad day for them yesterday, certainly. Bradford beat Crawley in the other game in the division. Crawley. Slow starters uh, over the last few games, and that's that's caused them a few problems. But Bradford are a side that are coming on strong. Uh, no surprise at all to see them start to pick up some important uh, important results. They've got a good squad. They've got a manager who's been there, done it as well. Um, I think you know, apart from Newport, they've got the best home record as well this season in the division. Luke, yeah, is this? I mean, we weren't sure what to expect from them. We thought it'd be a bit of a transition, but it, it looks like he's finally found a, a sort of a system that is is he's comfortable with and that his players are comfortable with, and they've done very well considering they've had a few injuries as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, and again, there's there's a, there's another club with massive sort of expectation. You could say probably League Two's Sunderland in that sense is that they'd, they'd be expected to to make playoffs at an absolute minimum, especially with a manager. Um, as, as sort of decorated as Bowyer, but you know, lost lost one in five, uh, lost one, but of one five and seven at Valley Parade. That the home form, the atmosphere there will be massive. It's it's 
as it has been in previous years, no team can match that sort of support off the pitch in this division, um, especially when things are going well. So they, they've already got that going for them as well as, as playing very well at home. And I think that one defeat was to Forest Green in, in quite controversial circumstances. But yeah, it, I think the key thing, the changes, they won their last three unbeaten in four or five. But the, the, the key thing is they, they played a lot um, at the start of this season with both Vaughan and Donaldson up front. Um, and, and despite their experience, perhaps not as mobile, um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm interested to see what you think of that, Charlie, in terms of if they if they did have that sort of pace, um, maybe maybe I'm wrong, but they didn't seem that mobile. And I think ever since they've kind of gone with one of them up front, had support in players out in wide positions, sort of gone for a 4-3-3 or 4-2-3-1 rather than a 4-4-2. And in recent weeks, it's really paid off with, with having those players alongside of them to kind of give them a little bit more mobility in the final third. Yeah, uh, well, it's funny because Bradford is probably our best performance of the season, certainly from my point of view. Um, and they did obviously play uh, Bourne and Donaldson up top. Who straight away you look at that and think, well, you know, great experience, um, played at you know the highest level, uh, if not you know very high levels. So we had to be wary, but I think they set up wrong probably against us. They they they, mm. they dropped off far too deep and couldn't really get up got up the pitch. Um, quick enough uh, although we gave away two cheap goals um, we did score three on the night so yeah they've, they've changed it I think they've brought in Hope Akban he's been out injured he's come back in and, and done really well recently maybe solidified the, the midfield and uh, I think yeah wide areas got like this is Elias Ismail who's um, a really good player hasn't probably kicked on as as much as he'd want to but um, no but then they've always got the options um, obviously Vaughan Donaldson both of them one or the other so and you've said it all about the, the support and the stadium and, and um, yeah big club uh, good manager so they'll, they'll be they'll be the team to beat um, come come the end of the season I'm sure yeah I think they'll be right up there and, and Crawley scored in every game this season um, you know they've they've got very good numbers very good data they're playing you know, one of the most improved sides this season so that's a, that's a very good result for Bradford. Uh, right, let's jump into our mailbox because uh, you certainly are very popular, Mr. Ragland. So we've got some questions for you from the fans to go through now. The D3, D4 mailbox. Your views, your say. Perfect. Right, let's start with uh, JT, who says, how far can Cheltenham team go this season? Um, well, we, we've, we've started well. Um, what are we? A quarter of the way through. So... Um, it's it's a difficult one to say. I think the lads at the minute, um, driven by the manager, really are uh, a cliche bunch where they, they 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 talk about the next game and performing well, winning. Don't get bored of that. Don't think we've become a good team overnight um, because we 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 are little old Cheltenham, you know. In this league, you look at the you look at Bradford and uh, Plymouth and people like that, teams like that. Sorry. Um, we 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 are the underdog and uh, we kind of like it like that, so we 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 embrace that. Um, but don't lose that mentality when when we're going to places like Warsaw because we could have easily been rolled over today after whatever it was winning three away games and thinking we're a good side. So uh, to answer his question, um, I'm not sure. It's just a case of keep doing what we're doing, um, and if we have bad spells uh, or difficult spells, should say. Uh, you know, uh, override them quickly and get over the disappointments. And that's a, a big message that's uh, driven home by the manager. Yeah, I always get the feeling that, you know, something that Phil Parkinson always talked about as well, is you don't get too high with the highs, don't get too low with the, with the lows, you just keep keep on going. Um, mm. Trying to see who this... Gwen Dizzle is. <laughs> Looks like he's the uh, the Twitter handle of this chat. So, opinions on Greavesy? Yeah, Jacob Greaves. Um well, young lad. I mean, I think he's eighteen, nineteen, coming on on from on loan from Hull. Uh, we lost probably, you know, one of our best defenders, Will Boyle, through uh, an unfortunate injury in the first game. Um, so he came in last minute, and he's he's done he's done great. He's, he has done great, and he's at the minute he's keeping Boyle out of the team. And you know, anyone who knows Will Boyle, he he, he wears his heart on his sleeve, and he's a he's a, he's a really good player, both left footed. Um, but yeah, the, the impressive thing is Greasy's, Greasy's age, uh, and you know nothing phases him. Um, really, really good lad. Uh, again, sort of nice, nice lad. But has definitely got that aggression when he plays, and you know he's a good size, so he's, he's got bags of potential. Um, and the way he's going at the minute, hopefully it carries on for us. 
um because he's playing well and, and we're doing we're doing okay so um yeah he's he's, he's come in and he's, he's done great yeah he's very impressive i mean i'm I'm shocked that, you know 18 outrageous I, I, I feel old when you say that but yeah um will smith has asked the question what's it like to have duffo as the gaffer and is he the best manager you've played under uh yeah it's difficult on that um I've been fortunate to play for some good managers. Um, Michael Atherton at Oxford, I, I, I thought I rated very highly. Um, Paul Cook gave me my chance in, in League One um, for five years ago now. So, But I think, yeah, overall, I think Michael Duff uh, is probably the best manager I've played for. Um, I think striking the balance of what you want, um, man management or, you know, more sort of mentality-wise, uh He's, he's, he's very good at it and very hot on. Um, tactically, he's come in and not many people can just throw a three-five-two together and 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 get it working um, like we like I think we have done. Uh, and he's, he's, you know, if you listen to what well, like we said about Carl Fletcher going to to, to Bournemouth and him uh, the gaffer going, you know, being at Burnley for so long, he's 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 learnt off some of the best coaches in the world and some of the best managers. So he's. Uh, He's, he's, he's carried that through to Cheltenham, um, and he's got a good group of group of players. So, yeah, he's, he's probably the best manager I've I've, I've worked for. So, uh, hopefully, you know, we we can have some success together, and uh, he stays for you know a long time. I, I hope so. It's looking very good so far, and I think it was a great credit to Cheltenham to to give him that chance as well in management. Because, like we said before, always tempting, I suppose, to go with the tried and tested. But there are some great young coaches out there who deserve an opportunity. Owen Knight asked the question to bet the best defender you've played with and against. Uh, played with, uh, well, probably had, well, at the minute I'm playing with two or three very good defenders. If you look at, uh, about three, I think Ben Toes has been probably the best player at Cheltenham since I came in. Um, and by all accounts, he might have had a difficult time when he first, First arrived at club, but uh, he's definitely up there. The other one I'd say I had my, probably my best my best spell playing for Oxford when I played five or six games with Curtis Nelson. Um, he's a good friend of mine as well, so uh, I'll probably say say Nelson. At the, and obviously he's got a great great move to to Cardiff. So yeah, Curtis Nelson played played with against difficult one. Um, trying to think. At the, at the time. I mean, recently we played Leicester City in a pre-season game and Harry Maguire did play, as did uh, Johnny Evans. And I was going to say, that must have been where he learnt all his stuff. Watching yeah. Knew that was coming. Something like that. Something like that. I think I'm, I'm closer to his brother who I played with at, at Chesterfield. But um, I, 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 against is, is a difficult one. Um, I think Johnny Evans was probably someone that I, I looked up to uh, a lot when he, you know, from his Manchester United days, and then to play against him, even if it was for 45 minutes in a pre-season game, I think he, he used used class. And from what I hear of people like Gavin White, he he doesn't make a mistake. Um, I think they don't know if he's right-footed or left-footed, so it says it all. Um, and yeah, he's he's top player. Uh, the real Ben Hodge has asked the question, saying, "Who in your squad?" wouldn't get a round in even though it was their turn anyone who uh, wants to attempt to get a round in calls a taxi pretty sharpish yeah I think I, cobwebs I, on the wallet I think I saw that one and um, I think yeah someone came to mind straight away and it uh, and it was Will Boyle um, and I know he'll probably listen to this podcast so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I was I was yeah I was I was happy to say say him and he'll know he'll know <laughs> oh, brilliant stuff uh, Matthew Green who uh, I hope you're well, Matthew. I met him at uh, Blackpool with his son Joshua, so hope you guys are doing well and indeed enjoying the run of form Oxford have been on. He asked a question, same here as Gabe Sutton says. Uh, well, Gabe Sutton says, well done on some excellent displays for Cheltenham, Charlie. I'm wondering how you might have reacted to being seemingly discarded at Oxford. Were you surprised that Carl Robinson and the coaching staff did not seem to see a place for you in the squad at the time? And Matthew echoes that with the question, were you disappointed that you weren't given a chance at Oxford after Appleton there? Uh, well, yeah, is the is the short answer. Um, it was a strange time because obviously I had my first season with with Michael Appleton and we I, I was in and out of the side to be honest. I mean, I was up against two really good defenders, Shay Dunkley and Curtis Nelson, who have both gone on to bigger and, and and better things if you like. Um, 
and then I signed for two years, moved to the area, and was really looking forward to to, to being a part of something something good. Um, then the manager left, which happens. Um, next manager came in, who I was sort of building a good rapport with, if you like. Uh, and then I had a, a, probably my worst injury of my career, where I was out for five or six months with a an ankle ligament injury. And um, in that time, they'd signed John Mustino, Mike Williamson, Rob Dickey. So straight away, the, the pathway was sort of blocked up a bit, bit more than it was before. So, um, yeah, and then I was frustrated with having been out for so long. I was desperate to play and probably made a bit of a rash decision to, to go on loan, um, to Port Vale, a club that I knew very well. So I, you know, I felt that it was, it was a good thing to do. Um, played some games, but it didn't probably go to plan. Uh, and then coming back, my only gripe was, that I wanted a, maybe a bit more clarity a bit earlier. So I was desperate to play for Oxford United. Um, you know, like I said, the fans were brilliant with me, whether I was playing or wasn't playing. They they, they always supported me, as they did everybody. And uh, I was desperate to play, but I just I, I, I felt like I wasn't told early enough. And, and that was my only thing. Um, but then it was a case of just getting my head down and making the most of of, of, of any sort of games that I, that I did get. Which mainly came in the in the trophy, um, which I think is how the manager at Cheltenham first saw me. So you know you, you can't knock it, and I, I, I'm I'm quite proud of the fact that I did keep, keep my head down, and you know I tapped into the likes of Sean Derry and tried to sort of get all you know any information advice I could out of him um, and people like that. Uh, I never fell out with the manager. The manager was was always. Was always uh, good in that sense. I just, yeah, I just never got the opportunity. Is uh, even though, you know, the, the amount of times I asked for one, I, I never got one. So uh, things move on, and um, I love my time there. And uh, I'm, I'm, you know, like I said before, things things turn out funny, and I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, delighted with how things are going at Cheltenham now. Interesting question from an ex-Oxford teammate here. A certain Ryan Ledson asks, on average, how many pints do you sink on an all day? Oh, I don't know what he's on about. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that's yeah, typical of typical of him. He's a a big character again, uh, a young lad with with such a big big character, um, and and no surprise that he's done so well. Um, see, how I'm serving swerving the question. Uh, we, yeah, no, we've we've had some good 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 uh, good nights out, good t- good uh, team days out with with the lads, which you know I think most people would say is is important at the right time. Um, so I wouldn't wouldn't put a number on it. I think I could probably drink more than him. <laughs> we all know your teetotal, Charlie. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. That's it. Uh, final question from Jonathan Harry says Cheltenham and their home form uh, it's been sensational. What do you put that down to? Uh, well, it's difficult to put your finger on because, and likewise, when we were losing away, it's difficult to put a thing, finger on that. Um, but I think I think it's. More of a, again, I've mentioned it a few times, mentality wise, we seem to, and we've spoken about this a lot as a group and, and with, with the staff and, and the manager at home, we seem to have a belief, uh, you know, an absolute confidence that we're going to, we're going to score at least and we're going to, we're going to play well. You know, we push our shoulders back and we, we pass the ball and, and, you know, we've, we've been a goal, de- goal behind on plenty of occasions and still come back and, and won. Uh, and I think away from home, it was the polar opposite, really. You know, any sign of disappointment, we seem to revert to type and, and be the typical away team in League Two and, and go a bit longer and a bit straighter. Uh, and it just wasn't us. So uh, combining the two was was a case of uh, our mentality and, and our belief that we 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 can we can compete with anybody. Uh, so run hard is the is the first thing um, and pass the ball and believe uh, that you know in in in, the, in your mates around you brilliant charlie it's been an absolute pleasure having you on this podcast so thank you so much for taking the time out this morning to speak to us and for answering all the questions i uh, hope you've enjoyed it i have yeah not a problem uh, thanks for having me uh, yeah you know, you're real pleasure more than welcome more than welcome and luke thank you as always for your contribution no problem at all it's good to have a child and sort of dominated podcast i'll uh, <laughs> happy with that <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'll have to I'll have to nip that in the bud quite quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and guys, thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you could give this podcast a share, give it a retweet, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next week for 
more League One or Two coverage. Until then, goodbye.